So we are delighted to have today with us in our Barilan University Vision Science Seminar, Professor Erica Lynn Westerman from the University of Arkansas. Professor Westerman did her BSc at Yale in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and then an MSc in Zoology at the University of New Hampshire. Um, she then did her PhD at Yale in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology under the supervision of Antonia Montero, I hope I, I, I pronounced that correctly. And after that, after her PhD, she did a postdoc at the University of Chicago in Ecology and Evolution. After her postdoc, she joined the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Arkansas, where she is now faculty and leads the Westerman Lab for Integrative Animal Behavior. Her research aims to investigate how organisms perceive and interact with their environment and how variations in these organism environment interactions facilitate diversity. Her lab integrates whole organism behavioral research with genomics, development, and neurobiology to study the mechanisms driving behavioral and morphological diversity. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Erica, to our seminar to tell us about your exciting research. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Sharon. It's such a pleasure to get to talk to you all and to share my research. Uh, it's, it's very exciting to get to talk up to a vision audience about our work on a group of animals that is remarkably focused on the visual world. So I will be talking about mechanisms of visual diversity from evolutionary processes to instantaneous responses. And a lot of the research that I'm going to be talking about features animals such as those in this picture, that, that beautiful swallowtail butterfly that we're seeing there. So one of the big goals of evolutionary biology is to understand the incredible diversity in form and patterning and color that we see throughout the world. And we can think about that in this di diversity of species. So we've got a, a smattering of animals here from a variety of different phylogenetic groups. But we can also think about that in the context of diversity within closely related species or within between different populations of the same species, such as what we see here when we look at the abdomens of the happy face spiders across uh, different populations of happy face spiders in the Hawaiian Islands. While these are all happy face spiders, the happy faces on these spiders are all slightly different. And there are a number of different evolutionary forces that can drive this diversity in form. Different habitats may influence which morphology and color patterning is best adapted to living in those environments. The color palette that is best adapted to the prairies of the Midwestern United States are different from the color palettes that are best adapted to coral reefs. Predation pressure and the visual systems and sensory systems of predators can influence what patterns and shapes are best adapted in their predators to avoid being consumed. And within species interactions, such as mate selection can also influence how different animals end up evolving to appear and what patterns and morphology they have. And this communication between individuals is something that we're particularly interested in in my lab. And when we think about communication, whether it's visual communication or other modes of communication, we're talking about both a signaler, which is where a lot of what a lot of us think of when we're thinking about visual signals and evolution, but also a receiver, an individual who's receiving the information that the signaler is attempting to convey. And we can think about this in this context of the Tasmanian devil and the female, the she devil. In this particular context, if the Tasmanian devil couldn't see blue, it would be highly unlikely that that female Tasmanian devil would be wearing a blue bonnet and blue shoes. Now this communication can occur within species, but you can also have heterospecific individuals such as predators like this raptor who, who are also engaging in communication with the signaler and 
Communication doesn't happen in a vacuum. The environment in which communication occurs influences how easy it is for the receiver to perceive the signals that a signaler is sending. For example, the internet connections that we all have influence how easy it is for all of you to understand and see the visuals and hear the audio associated with the messages that I'm attempting to convey. So my research group is very interested in this communication process and specifically how receiver physiology influences the evolution of signals. And we focus on mate selection as the communication that we're most, form of communication that we're most interested in because we think that's pretty cool and a fun, fun aspect of communication to study. And we use butterflies primarily to study this question because butterflies with moths are the second most speciose group of animals on the planet. There are over 100,000 species of Lepidoptera. They come in a diversity of colors. They come in a diversity of life histories and mating behaviors and Butterflies specifically use approximately two thirds of their brains to process visual information. So they are very focused on visual information. And as a group that's interested in visual communication and visual signaling, this is a great system to work with. A little bit about how we approach problems as we are an integrative lab. So we try and take a holistic approach to understanding visual communication in these systems. We start out with the genome of a fertilized oocyte. We then look at how that genome interacts with the physical environment and social environment during development to produce an adult sensory system. And then we look at how that adult sensory system interacts with the social environment and physical environment at a given moment in time to cause changes in the decisions or the behaviors that these butterflies exhibit. And then we look at how those variation in decisions influence future uh, population and, and uh, in terms of phenotypes and genotypes. Most of the people in the lab work on different aspects of this holistic view. And here I'm just showing some of the, under, the graduate students and, and postdocs that work on these different elements of this cycle. We also have lots of undergraduates that help collect this data because uh, working with butterflies is can be a, a, a lot of work in terms of keeping these animals alive in the lab. Now, today, I'm just gonna focus on three stories amongst this cycle of work that we do and the featuring the work of some of the different graduate students and postdocs and undergrads in the lab. And I'm gonna, because this is a vision audience, I'm gonna focus on the visual diversity that we studied. So specifically, we're gonna talk about visual diversity across three timescales. We're gonna start out looking at evolutionary timescales and how the habitats and evolutionary or phylogenetic history may shape the diversity of visual systems that we see when we look across all sighted animals. We're then gonna to move to developmental timescales and look at how the physical environment during development can influence the visual systems of the butterflies that we see, focusing in on a specific species of butterfly. And then we're gonna move away from the physical environment and look at how the social environment can cause almost instantaneous changes to the visual system that influence downstream behavior and uh, looking at a different individual species of butterfly and how they learn visual cues. So starting out with evolutionary time skills, we are very interested in my lab and how habitat and evolutionary history shapes opsin evolution. So opsins are the, the photosensitive pigments in the eyes of animals and or sighted animals. And this is a project that my graduate student, Matt Murphy completed. And we were looking at animals. And when we look at animals, you see this incredible diversity of color and shape and pattern. 
And when we look at the visual systems of a diverse set of animals, we also find that different species have different visual sensitivities. So here we have uh, invertebrates on the left, vertebrates on the right, terrestrial systems in the top, it, uh, aquatic systems on the bottom. And if we're looking at the number of opsins or, or, or types of photoreceptors, this is a little bit more complicated than just opsins, but types of photoreceptors that these but if these different animals have, you can see that some have a wide visual range, some have a narrow visual range, and sometimes the visual range is shifted. And for some of these graphs, you'll see many curves, some only have a couple curves. So there, there can be a huge variety in visual sensitivities when we look across animals. And it's also true that if you look at the light that's available in different habitats, that changes across habitat. So for example, forests have predominantly, have predominantly green light under the canopy with white sun flecks coming through in the gaps. If we look at coastal waters, they are green and yellowish light if we look at grasslands, you're gonna have predominantly white light. So all of the wavelengths of light are, are available in that space. And if we look at open ocean, you're getting mostly blue light. There's a lot of the light attenuates as you get further in the water column. And there's long been a hypothesis that animals have what we call habitat associated visual tuning, where the wavelengths of light that an animal is able to see and is, are consequently using as their signals are the wavelengths of light that are available in that habitat. So if we look at this uh, blue green light shifted habitat in the open ocean, you might expect to have an animal whose spectral sensitivity, so the colors of light they can see, are gonna be shifted to that blue green light so they can take advantage of the light that's there. While an animal that lives in an open plain may and has access to a wider range of colors may have a more broad spectrum visual abilities. However, this visual tuning may also be constrained by evolutionary history. So when we're thinking about how the opsins change and which proteins can change where to change what colors of light there's the options are sensitive to there may be some evolutionary constraints that limit what uh, mutations will actually work and what ranges of colors an animal might be able to see and if we look at invertebrates and vertebrates we see that invertebrates or non-chordate bilaterians use what we call r-type pigments so these are rhabdomeric pigments while chordates use C-type or ciliary pigments, rods and cones. And we are curious to see if this split between having a R-type pigments or C-type pigments might influence the range of colors or the types of colors that animals may be able to see and how able they are to adapt to their different habitats. So to address this question, we conducted a meta-regression so we started out with two very large searches in Google Scholar using visual pigment, opsin, otsum sensitivity, visual spectrum, lambda max as different search terms, removing uh, medical papers. So we cut out, uh, we only wanted like one human represented in here so that we, we'd have like some sense of the range of human because we're looking for species specific data. And then we filtered all the papers that we got uh, to check whether it was written in English uh, so that we could make sure we understood the methods and could extract the data that we needed, that there was a sample size greater than one. So at least two individuals had to be tested and that the animals were reared in natural lighting conditions. This was important because uh, sometimes the lighting conditions that you rear an animal in influence what an animal can see. And we'll come to that a little bit uh, in, our, in the next story that I tell. This took us down to 156 articles, which contained 446 species. So we did get a, a pretty good spread in terms of animal species for this study. 
Uh, we then extracted data from this paper. So we pulled out opsin sensitivity using uh, electrophysiology or in cell culture and where the animals were caught. And the particular information that we were pulling when we were looking at opsin sensitivity was first, how many opsins did they have? So we're looking at visual pigment sensitivity curves here. And to get us all oriented to these figures, I know many of you probably look at these types of figures, but for anybody who is new to this and to make sure we're all on the same page. If we're looking at uh, a figure of opsin sensitivity, here we have the wavelengths on the x-axis, so ranging here from 300 to 700. We've got visual pigment sensitivity curves, which in most, in many cases, this is when you stick an electrode in uh, a, either a opsin or a photopigment, and you're looking, at, uh, flashing a lot of different lights at them, and then seeing what they're responding or depolarizing to the most. So you get these spectral curves for the different visual pigments within the eyes of these animals, and the peak of this visual sensitivity curve is what we would call the wavelength of maximum sensitivity or lambda max. So we pulled uh, lambda max for every single visual pigment in all of the animals that we were looking at. And then we focused in on the longest lambda max, the shortest lambda max, and then the lambda max range to give us a sense of the range of light that these animals could see. We then went and had these 446 species, and then we found the habitats for these 446 species. So we went through uh, field guides, public databases, and online encyclopedias to find uh, the habitat classifications of all of the different species we were looking at. For terrestrial systems, we classified them as closed or intermediate, open, generalist, or subterranean. For aquatic, we had lake river, estuarine coastal, other marine and generalist. And then we also had some that were categorized as no data. And then we took all of this information and we made some models to look at how uh, the habitat and phylogenetic history or evolutionary history influenced the lambda max of the longest, the lambda max shortest, and the range of light that these animals could see. We got a number of different chordates and non-chordates across all of the habitats, habitat types that we were looking at. So we have, three, just to give a few numbers, we had um, 355 aquatic species and 91 terrestrial species. So it's defi definitely our visual data is aquatic species heavy. Uh, that's one argument for collecting more data on terrestrial species. We were a little surprised that it was that skewed, but that's the data that's out there. Uh, and we had data for 868 different opsins from aquatic species and 246 opsins from terrestrial species. So we have a lot of opsin data in this analysis. You'll notice that we have a couple, we have a few different phyla. We have the chordata, we have arthropoda, we have mollusca, and we have cnidarians represented in this particular phylogeny. And partially due to the fact that we only have three transitions between land and sea, uh, we actually weren't able to do phylogenetic controls for the first couple of analyses I'm going to talk about, but we were able to do phylogenetic controls for, for one of the later analyses. So the first result that I'm going to share is that we found that terrestrial animals see longer wavelengths than aquatic animals. So terrestrials shown here in green and aquatic is in blue. You've got the visual spectrum of humans as a reference point here on the right and the longest lambda max here on the, on the uh, y axis on the left. We see something very similar when we look at shorter wavelengths. So terrestrial animals see shorter wavelengths than aquatic animals as well. And consequently, as you might expect when you combine those two together, terrestrial animals see a broader range of wavelengths than aquatic animals do. And this is, is even on top of this, invertebrates see a broader range of wavelengths than 
vertebrates do, and that is largely driven by terrestrial invertebrates. So terrestrial invertebrates have an average range of lambda maxes that's around 100 nanometers, which is that is pretty large in that relative to terrestrial vertebrates, which is only 83, aquatic vertebrates, which the average is 36, and aquatic inverts, which is 18. So basically, our terrestrial invertebrates are seeing a much wider range range of light than pretty much everybody else out there. At least when you're averaging across systems and looking at the the species that, for which we have data available. Now, one could think that this pattern might be driven by deep water animals. So we removed the deep water animals and just compared coastal and freshwater systems to closed intermediate uh, slash intermediate uh, terrestrial systems and open specialist terrestrial systems. And even doing that, we find that still those terrestrial systems, they're seeing longer wavelengths, longer mat lambda maxes and uh, shorter, shorter lambda maxes. And then uh, also, uh, they have wider ranges. Now, when we look into more fine scale data, so if we're looking just at so the uh, terrestrial system or just at the aquatic system, here we do have enough transitions between habitats so we can start thinking about evolutionary history and whether there might be constraints on uh, what animals, how animals can change to match their visual environments. And in this situation, we actually did find that evolutionary history did seem to be constraining the, the visual systems that we see. So here, what you're looking at is the uh, longest lambda max on the left, the center is shortest, and the on the right, you've got range. And the lambda, the pagal lambda is an estimate of the effect of the phylogenetic control. And when it's quite high, that indicates that there is a strong signature of evolutionary history on the whatever trait you're looking at. So here you can see that the uh, evolutionary history of animals that are living in either closed, intermediate, uh, gen being a generalist or being an open specialist, does have an effect on their visual sensitivity. We see the same thing for visual range. Interestingly, there doesn't seem to be an effect of phylogeny on the shortest lambda max that these animals can see. Though there is no effect of habitat in and of itself, this is not statistically significant. Now, I'm not showing it, but we also find a similar effect in aquatic systems and relative to depth. So phylogenetic history has a greater effect than uh, depth at which an animal lives on the animal's visual systems. So to summarize opsin diversity and visual range over evolutionary time in sighted animals, we found that terrestrial animals, and especially invertebrates, have greater visual ranges than aquatic animals, even when deep sea animals are excluded from our analysis. And while we weren't able to include evolutionary history in our analysis of the land, uh, aqua sea to land transitions, because that happens so rarely in animals, we do see that evolutionary history does matter and that it may constrain both terrestrial and aquatic visual systems and the ability of animals to modify their visual systems to the light available to them as they transition from being an open habitat to then a closed habitat uh, species and vice versa. So now that we've talked a little bit about how evolutionary timescales and the physical environment and uh, genetic history over time can shape the visual diversity that we see in all sighted animals, we're now gonna zoom in on one group of animals, the butterflies, and start looking at the effects of developmental timescales on influencing visual systems.
And this is work that has been largely done by my graduate student who just, just defended her thesis last Monday, uh, Dr. Grace Herschel. So what I'm presenting you here are two pictures of a prairie here in Northwestern Arkansas. And the picture that you see on the left is July, the beginning of July, and, and the picture that you see is in September. These two pictures were taken from the exact same lo location by the same person. Uh, so the change in how, how big the trees look has to do with the fact that the grass has grown considerably. This is a tall grass prairie. So the prairie can get quite tall. Uh, and there are a number of things that change in these environments just between the beginning of July to September. We get change in background color. We get change in height of the foliage. Um, we also get changes in the total amount of ambient light that is available to the butterflies to use. So here you're looking at seasonal changes in total irradiance over time. This green line represents a prairie very similar to the prairie I just showed you photographs from. As you can see in June and July, you've got a high amounts of light available to the butterflies. As you're getting to September and October, there's just less light in the environment. And we also get seasonal changes in temperature here in Northwestern Arkansas. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Arkansas, which is okay, it's most people. Uh, when I moved to Arkansas, I had a lot of friends and family who had to pull out maps and try and figure out where Arkansas was in the United States. We're sm kind of smack dab in the middle, right above Louisiana. Uh, so we do not have as big winters as what you're going to get in, say, Michigan or Maine or New York City. But we do still get winters. We do still get seasonal change in temperature throughout the year. And in places that have seasonal changes in temperature and light and background color, we have animals that exhibit seasonal behaviors. They may have specific seasons where they reproduce versus not reproducing. We have animals that go into dormancy at different times of the year. I don't know. Um, wait, I'm going to pause the record. Learning about. <laughs> All right. So uh, animals experience dormancy uh, to get through winter conditions, uh, and they can also migrate to escape harsher conditions. Well, I just showed you a number of vertebrates doing that, but butterflies do that too. They exhibit all of these changes in seasonal behaviors. They have seasonal reproduction. They go into dormancy and some species also migrate. And in addition with these behaviors that are responses to environmental conditions, a number of species also have uh, changes in morphology that are associated with changes in season. So what you're looking at here are three different species the butterflies on the top row and the butterflies on the bottom row are actually the same species. They're just butterflies that were reared in different environmental conditions. And these are what we call seasonal polyphenisms. Excuse me. And these seasonal polyphenisms that are changes in color pattern can be critically important to helping these butterflies live in different seasons. So this is not a change like what we see in many mammals where they shed a coat. This is where we have uh, butterflies that have short generation time. So you have a, a butterfly that's living in one season and you have a different butterfly living in a later season. And those two generations have different wing patterns. Now, butterflies are highly visual animals. Two thirds of their brains are for visual signaling. They are primarily using visual cues to find mates. They use visual cues to find food and many are highly camouflaged to help them escape from predators. So while we have these animals, so we have these animals that change in behavior in response to the season, they change their, many of them change their morphology 
in response to the season, but we know virtually nothing about whether or not they also change their visual systems and their ability to see these signals that are changing with these different seasonal forms. So we were particularly curious about that and, and in a, a natural setting. So we wanted to see if butterflies out in nature that are experiencing all of the like, real seasonal change that you see out in the field, if butterflies have matched changes in their wing patterns and in their visual systems. So for this study, we use the butterfly the, called the common buckeye, otherwise known as Genonia senia. It's this beautiful nymphalid here. It's got these gorgeous eye spots on the dorsal surface of their wings. They're very abundant here in the prairies, but they're found throughout the United States and the Americas. So, oops. So this butterfly is abundant and native to North America. They are known to be seasonally polyphenic in terms of wing pattern. So they have this lighter form in the summer. And then in the fall, they get this kind of dark russet color. There are also some changes in behavior. They are more sedentary and fly shorter distances when they are a fall form relative to a summer form. So while we know a little bit about their visual, their wing patterns, we know virtually nothing about their visual system and any polyphenisms in their visual system. And we know very little about these butterflies in general here in the middle of the country. Most of the work has been done on the coasts and coastal populations may be different than the populations we see here in the middle of the country. So, or the Great Plains of the United States. So we had a couple different questions about these butterflies. We wanted to look at how the developmental environment may shape visual signals and visual perception concurrently. So we are first asked when the change in wing color occurs in our study populations here in the tall grass prairies of Arkansas. And then we looked at whether changes in this visual system accompany changes in wing pattern. To do this, I'm uh, first gonna talk about our wing pattern collections. We went to three different field sites. So three trail grass prairies in Northwestern Arkansas. Those are shown here on the right. We did surveys from May to early November in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And every week, every other week, we went out and collected animals to look at changes in wing color. We scored them in two different ways. We used a historic method um, that has been used since the early 90s, what we call qualitative wing scores where we go from uh, this summer form that's very light with these larger eye spots on the dorsal hindwing to a fall form, which is a very dark red. It can get even redder than what you're seeing here with much smaller eye spots. We also used quantitative measurements. So we took wing reflectance measurements with a spectro spectrometer, spectrometer. Uh, it's a jazz spectrometer. And we specifically focused on this spot on the hind wing. We use generalized linear models in R to analyze seasonal coloration change over time. And I'm now gonna show you our wing pattern data. When we're looking at wing scores, we find that wings get darker in September. So this is that scoring of one to five. We get this big change here in September. Incidentally, this matches when the temperatures drop considerably. So this change in wing color corresponds with the change in ambient temperature. And we see wing reflectance getting darker in October, so just a little bit later when we see the wing, the qualitative score happening uh, in, in the previous analyses. So both quantitatively and qualitatively, we have these butterflies getting darker at, uh, towards the end of September, beginning of October. Now I will say that this is a little bit later than previously has re been recorded for coastal populations. But since the last tests of coastal populations happened in the early 90s, we don't know if this difference and when we see that dark form showing up in our population is to, has to do to coastal versus prairie environments or climate change. So one of the things that we may be looking at in the future is looking at how uh, temperatures have changed, not so much just where uh, the timing is of this change is happening.
But to get back to the visual system, we do now know that we have this change in seasonal wing pattern and we know what when it happened. We wanted to see if changes in the visual system accompany changes in seasonal wing pattern in Genonia senia. So to do this, we've collected animals every two weeks from June through October in 2019, 2020, and 2021. We collected the eyes, uh, the heads out in the field, threw them in RNA later, brought them back to the lab, dissected out eye tissue, and did total RNA extraction. We ran two different analyses. We did an RNA-seq analysis of summer versus fall butterflies, and then we did a more temporally detailed analysis using qPCR. The RNA-seq analysis we did in collaboration with Bob Reed's lab uh, at the at Cornell University. So Noah Brady is a graduate student in, in the Reed lab that helped us with this analysis. And for samples, we took three females and three males each from June, July as our summer and October as our fall. These butterflies spanned the three years of sampling. We did RNA library prep and sequencing through NovaGen, and we did our analyses in R using DEC2. When we look at fall versus summer butterflies, we do find changes in the visual system. So there are 78 differentially expressed genes. And if you look at this figure, you see that actually the seasons cluster out quite nicely. Uh, one of the other things that I think is, is cool about this overall heat map, so for, for uh, those of you who may be new to reading heat maps, the rows are individual genes that are differentially expressed. The columns are individuals in our analyses. So and here we have the summer butterflies and the fall butterflies. And one thing that I kind of think is kind of neat to show here is that even within this analysis that's looking at differences between seasons in the summer, but not the fall, the sexes cluster out independently. So here you have your females and here you have your males. Now this is a broad picture of the differentially expressed genes, but now I wanna focus in on specific visual pigments. One of the pigments we were most interested in was absence. So those actual visual pigments. Genonia senia has three, just like we do, but their three are a little bit different. So they have a long wavelength, a blue or short wavelength, and an ultraviolet. And when we look at these absins, uh, they're all highly expressed, but we don't see an effect of season. And just to uh, uh, get you all a little bit oriented for these graphs, blue is female and red is male. And that's gonna continue through this, throughout the rest of the talk in general. Blue is female and red is male. Now, while we didn't see seasonal effects on absence, we did see changes in vision-related genes specifically associated with eye pigment. So here we're looking at Nina G, which is involved in eye pigmentation. Now we don't know exactly what it does in eye pigmentation, but we know it's important for eye pigmentation. And I'll get, get into a little bit of why we're excited about eye pigmentation in, in a little, in a couple of slides. So we find Nina G is upregulated in the summer and downregulated in the fall. We also see vermilion, which is part of visual system development, which is upregulated in the fall relative to the summer. And then we have another eye pigment gene, punch, which is upregulated in the fall relative to the summer. So why are we excited about these eye pigment genes? Well, if we look at butterfly eyes, for each of those little facets, in addition to having the, the photoreceptors, you also have a number of pigments that are kind of supplementary pigments in the eye that influence the amount of light that's getting to the eye. We have melanin pigment around the crystalline cone and around the rhabdome that helps make sure that the only light getting into that individual facet is the light that's directly in front of it. And that helps uh, increase visual acuity in the eye. And we have these filtering pigments alongside the rhabdomes of the photoreceptors. And in butterflies, 
these the colors of these filtering pigments can be different. I know this, so for example, here you have a yellow, and over here we've got a red, and this is actually an even darker red. <laughs> It'd be a little hard to see, but this is just an example of three different filtering pigments. And these filtering pigments limit the colors of light that are actually making it to the photoreceptor. So even though these butterflies only have three photoreceptors, if they have three or four different filtering pigments in each of these facets, that can add different dimensions on what colors of light are actually making it to those photoreceptors uh, and influence what wavelengths of light those photoreceptors are actually sensitive to. And we can kind of see this on a big scale when we look across the eyes of, butter of a different species of butterflies. So these are three examples of butterflies. So this is the squinting bush brown, and this is what their filtering pigments look like when you look at their eyes. It's a lot of yellow with a little bit of red. Here is the uh, Heliconius melpomene. Uh, so this is a postman and, and you can see lots of red and a little bit of yellow kind of evenly mixed. And here is a cabbage white, so Pyurus rapii, which has a lot of dark reds relative to these other species. So these filtering pigments can be incredibly important. And uh, while we don't know what Nina G <clears throat> and Punch are specifically doing to the Genonia eye, we do know their pigment genes and they're differentially uh, expressed. So there's potential for them influencing what the butterflies can see in these different seasonal forms even though there's no change in opsin. Now, at the same time that we were uh, doing this RNA-seq study, we were also doing qPCRs for fine scale temporal change, specifically in opsins. We also used a clock gene, the gene period, uh, to see if there was any change in circadian clocks along with these changes in season. And we did this for June, July, August, September, and October, males and females. Uh, and what we found was, I mean, we're gonna go, I'm going to go opsin by opsin. If we look at a blue opsin, we didn't find an effective season, but we did find higher expression of blue opsin in the females. So we are getting sexual dimorphism in visual eye expression, the opsin expression. So these females may be more sensitive to blue than males are. When we look at long wavelength opsin, we see no change across season or sex. The same for UV opsins. And when we look at period, we do get a seasonal effects in period with period having higher expression in the fall than we have in the summer. So looking at season, and these developmental time scales, we do see that season influences within population visual diversity, with these prairie genonia senia exhibiting seasonal changes in wing color, becoming darker as temperature and ambient light drop. And these seasonal changes in wing color are associated with seasonal changes in expression of visual pigment and development genes, though no changes in opsin genes, which is intriguing in thinking about what might actually be the way that these butterflies are, are plastically changing their vision over time. So lastly, uh, I'm, now that we've talked about evolutionary timescales and developmental timescales and how both can influence and constrain the visual systems of animals, we're now gonna shift away from looking at physical environments and I'm gonna end with spending a little bit of time looking at instantaneous or almost instantaneous responses of visual systems to social environment. And I'll try and just, uh, due to time constraints, I'll try and just kind of give this as, in a short form uh, so that there is time for questions. And for this experiment, we were using Bicyclus aninana, which is a subtropical African butterfly. These ha They have these fabulous eye spots on their wings. And like Genonia senia, they have a seasonal poly polyphenism. This is their summer form with those big eye spots. And then their fall form, their dry season form has virtually no eye spots. And this helps defend them against birds. This helps defend them against praying mantises. 
Now, these butterflies also have a known mate preference for spot number. So while I this picture is showing you the ventral wing surface, if we look on their dorsal surface, so you flip the butterflies over, they have these eye spots here. And females care about the numbers of eye spots. Naive wild type females prefer males that have two eye spots relative to four. But they can learn visual mate preferences. If you expose a female to a male that has four spots, when she's just come out of the chrysalis, she then learns a preference for four spots over two. This learning is biased. They don't learn preferences for reduced ornaments. I've never been able to get a female to learn a preference for zero spots. And this learning bias is sexually dimorphic. Females are really good at learning preferences for increases in spots, while male on the four wing, while males are actually really good at learning preferences for reductions in spots on the hind wing. So we've been kind of fascinated by this learning bias and the fact that like, the learning happens. And we're really interested in, in what causes the sexual dimorphism and preference learning and what changes are happening in the brain and potentially the eye when individuals are going through a learning process that results in a subsequent change in behavior. Like, how does that even work? And this is work that was done by my former postdoc, Dave Ernst, and a former undergraduate, Gabby Akawali. And we wanted to test three hypotheses. First, the hypothesis that male and female butterflies express different genes in their brains during social learning. Second, that this sex-specific expression occurs in the peripheral as well as the central nervous system. And uh, at at this point in time, there was still a discussion about whether eyes should be considered part of the peripheral system or the central nervous system for invertebrates. I know that, that is, we're moving towards considering them part of the central nervous system for vertebrates. I think that I'm now leaning towards including them as part of the central nervous system for inverts as well. Um, but there is currently some debate about that. And then we wanted to test whether the genes responsible for wing patterning or signal variation are involved. So is there perhaps a pleiotropic effect between what's going on on the wing patterns and what's going on in the brain? To do this, we took butterflies and we gave them a training experience. So a female, a newly emerged female or a newly emerged male was paired with an individual of the opposite sex that had the type of wing pattern that they were most likely to learn, or they were kept in isolation. We did that for three hours. That's our standard training period. We then chopped off their heads, threw them in liquid nitrogen, and later dissected out the brains and the eye and looked at differential expression across those tissue types. We compared naive and trained individuals across sex within sex, and we looked for interactions. So here we've got the contrast on the y-axis and the number of differentially expressed genes on the x-axis. We found that males and females do express different genes during learning. And gray is eye tissue, black is brain tissue. You'll notice that there's a lot more differentially expressed genes in the eyes than there are in the brains, which we thought was kind of amazing when we first saw that. And that actually th holds through for every single contrast. So whether we're looking at naive females versus naive males, if we're looking at uh, within sex trained females versus trained males, or sorry, uh, within sex trained females versus naive females or trained males versus naive females, naive males, there's a lot more going on in the eye than there is in the brain. So there's a lot of instantaneous changes that are happening in the eye. So what are some of those genes? And especially what are some of those vision genes? Well, we found differentially expressed vision genes, including retinol dehydrogenase, which is upregulated during those social interactions as in the eye. And we also found a number of eye development genes, such as smoothened, which is a G protein coupled receptor, and sense two, which has been implicated in, uh, sorry, sense, which has been implicated in mate preference in other butterfly systems. We also get differences in neurodevelopment genes and hormone signaling genes as well. So what about wing patterning genes? Uh, and why would I even care about wing patterning genes? Well, one of the reasons that we're interested in wing patterning genes is because we often do see things like, or, or, or hypothesize to see things like what we saw 
with genonia, where you get a change in the wing pattern, and maybe you also get a change in the eye. And this matched change in a trait and potentially the ability to perceive that trait or find that trait attractive is hypothesized to drive speciation processes. So if a gene that influences a trait that is preferred also simultaneously influences the preference for that trait, that would be considered a magic gene that could instantly cause speciation. So that would be an option A here. You could also have two genes that were physically adjacent to each other, or uh, that one influences preference and one influences the trait, or you could have those genes influencing preference and trait on different chromosomes and not physically linked. At this point in time, a number of color patterning genes have been identified in butterflies. These are genes that we know influence wing pattern elements. So this allows us to test whether these genes are also differentially expressed in the brains and eyes of butterflies. So we looked at these different genes to see if they were differentially expressed during this learning process. Many of them were, I'm just gonna highlight a couple that we know influence wing pattern elements on these butterflies' wings. And I'm now, since this, again, since this is a visually focused audience, I'm gonna highlight these two, which are causing changes in eye spots. So CD63 and Apteris, but, and are also differentially expressed during the learning process, which means they have the potential to be simultaneously influencing wing pattern and perception of those wing patterns. Now to delve into that a little bit further, we wanted to specifically ask whether wing patterning genes influence visual mate preference. And this is, this is very preliminary data, but I think it's super exciting. So I just wanna put it out there. Uh, so to do this, we've been knocking down a gene yellow, which is in the melanin pathway and changes the color of the butterflies. So this is a wild type butterfly. This is a F0 mosaic using CRISPR. So this part of the tissue was knocked out. This was not. We can make a pure line, which now looks completely yellow. And we're looking at the mate preference for spot number of these females. And just as a reminder, uh, the wild type butterflies prefer two spotted individuals over four spotted individuals. When we look at the preference of those uh, yellow butterflies, we're finding that they've lost the preference for two spots and are trending towards like in those four spot books. So when we're thinking about this instantaneous change and in the response to social scenario, we're finding that there are that visual mate preference learning changes both brain and gene eye expression. So sexually dimorphic gene expression occurs during learning in both eyes and brains. And this includes in the eye changes in vision, eye development, hormone, and neurodevelopment genes. And there's some indication that wing patterning genes, so genes that influence the traits that they find attractive, may also be important in this role, giving them a possible pleiotropic effects. So to summarize, we've talked about visual diversity across three different time scales. We've looked at how habitat and evolutionary history can drive and potentially constrain visual range in sighted animals in both terrestrial and aquatic systems. We've talked about how the developmental environment can induce simultaneous changes in vision and visual signals in a butterfly, and how social interactions can cause changes in eye gene expression, which lead to subsequent changes in mate choice and future behavior, all of which may help us get a better understanding of how we get the incredible visual diversity that we see. And with that, I'd like to thank all the members of my lab who make this research possible, those that I talked specifically about their work today, but everybody else who also helps rear the, the butterflies and is important for uh, conversations. And then I'd like to thank my funding sources, my collaborators, and all of you for listening and putting up with my temporary power outage. And I would be happy 
to take any questions. Thank you, Erica. That was really, really exciting. Um, I want to invite everybody to um unmute yourselves and let's give Erica a big uh, applaud. Uh, it was a really exciting talk. Um, and um, I'm opening the floor uh, for questions, of course. Um, anybody who is um interested. Um. So um, I'm not sure who's going to be asking, but I can start myself. Um, I want to ask you, we're talking about different um, species that uh, for the, about the first study that you examined. Yeah. And I wondered if you, if any of the species were amphibians, I mean, thinking that amphibians would be, uh, would, um, you know, be kind of like exposed to multiple lighting environments. Um, I I think we did have maybe one or two, but it was very fish heavy. So it was it, for for better or worse. There's been a a huge amount of interest in the fish community, the fish community, and studying vision in fish. So there are there's lots of data on fish. There is less data on kind of everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is a moderate amount of data on birds and uh, uh, some data on mammals. I th I think we did get an amphibian in there, but I'd want to go back and double check. But it's certainly not as common as, as one might like. And I, they would be really interesting to study. I can tell you kind of similar to amphibians mm -hmm. is that um, we do have some cool work on dragonflies. And dragonflies also have that going from being aquatic and going and being terrestrial. And they have really interesting visual systems and that the visual systems of the, the um, larvae, the nymphs are different in terms of what they are spectrally sensitive to than the uh, terrestrial adults. And we would expect to get similar changes in the amphibians. So we we might get amphibians that have, uh, if we looked at the full possible range, they might be a little bit more broad than the other aquatic animals. Um, it, it would be interesting to do a follow-up study and look at those animals that are both inverts and verts that are specifically transitioning from one to the other. Interesting, thank you. Um... Okay, we'll continue. <laughs> uh, what is the lifespan or how long do butterflies usually live? Um, sorry for my ignorance. Um, no, that's a great question. So it, it can be a little bit variable. The caterpillars usually live around um, a month to six weeks unless they are going to be uh, overwintering. So a number of species have diapause in a in a caterpillar stage or in a pupil stage, in which case that would be a longer development time. But the adults range from being a few weeks to the heliconius butterflies can live up to six months. So heliconius, oh, wow. yeah, heliconius butterflies eat pollen, which is a really good source of protein. And that helps them stay alive longer as adults and cats, I mean, their, their mushroom bodies. So the parts of their brains that are for learning and memory are, are quite large relative to most other species of butterflies. Thank you. Um, okay. Another question. <laughs> you yeah, said sorry you... I went so long. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was great. I mean, just the last question, I'm not gonna, um, bug you with any more of my, um, thoughts, but, um, you mentioned when you did the learning and uh, training basically of the three hours, and then you basically just looked at the expression of what that caused. And I wonder if you also, now that you have these results, if you thought about um, looking at some behavioral uh, expressions, not, not, um, not biological expressions, but actually behavioral expressions based on these trainings. I mean, do you know that um, the training of one group, let's say with uh, four dots or with zero dots would lead to different um, mate preference? I mean. Yes, we, we do actually. Um, and I, I wish I 
brought those bonus slides, but uh, <laughs> the for these butterflies, if you give them a three hour training with the four spots, they then mate preferentially with the four spots for females. For males, if you give them a three hour training with a butterfly with zero hindwing spots, they then prefer the zero hindwing spots. It's actually kind of even more interesting than that in the, in, in, we've delved a little bit more into this in the males and it doesn't just influence their preference in like who they actually ends up mating with, but it also influences their latency to mate. So how fast they make that mating decision. And it influences what they put in their spermatophores. So in butterflies, uh, males modify their, what, like what they give a female based on a variety of different things, including how attractive they find that female. And if you change how attractive they find that female through this training process, you can change what they are putting into that spermatophore. Uh, it's, at this point, we have relatively small sample sizes, so it, it's not, a, after false discovery, it's correction, it's not statistically significant in terms of the proteins that change, because uh, there are a lot of proteins in the spermatophore and in the seminal fluids, and so the changes are not massive, but they're, they are different. So what the, like, there's trends, they're, they're intriguing trends in, in a, that it looks like we're not just changing what they like, we're actually changing what they're doing and potentially consequently um, how many offspring they're, they're gonna have. So there seem to be a number of downstream effects. And we've also started teasing apart the time period. So we've done a three hour exposure was, was what this study was based on. But it turns out that, that um, when we check a, 30 minute, one hour, 90 minute, two hours exposure for the learning, at least for the females, they really need that three hours. If it's less than three hours, they don't change their preference. Hmm. And a 90 minute exposure seems to have like no effect at all. Wow. Um, Interesting. And, yeah. And we are also finding if we look at brain gene expression, that uh, the gene expression during that exposure is dynamic. So there are, there's like a first wave of initial gene ex differential gene expression at one hour, and then there's a decrease in differential expression at, at 90 minutes. And then it starts to pick back up again when you go to the two hours and the three hours. So there's a lot going on during that social interaction in the brain in terms of changing in gene expression and uh, lots of transcription is happening. And that ends it is what we think is associated with driving that downstream change in behavior. A project that we're working on right now is looking at like, okay, what is actually going on in the brains of the individuals who have been trained to during the mate choice process to see if we can identify what the long-term changes are. So is anything that is differentially expressed during the training still differentially expressed when they're actually choosing an individual? Wow, interesting. Um, I'd like to thank you a lot for joining us. I mean, it's your very, very early hour and in general. Um, it was thanks pleasure. again for for a fascinating talk, um, really um, very different from human um, <clears throat> from human vision, but still really fascinating. And I wonder how many of these also relate to human vision that we don't know about. I I um, would, I'm sure many many things are the same in terms of responsiveness. I have a, a continuously fascinated with our ability to see and the plasticity of our visual systems. Thank you so much, Erica. And um, again, uh, a big applaud for your wonderful um, talk today.
Um, and I hope to see you again with us um, in uh, future talks, but don't feel obliged. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was such a treat. Wishing you all the best.